Due Process, recipient of six Mid-Atlantic Emmy Awards. Despite the legal and cultural resistance to government measures that threaten speech, the government continues to press such measures relentlessly. And there's nothing new about attempts to limit free speech in times of war and crisis. In the past, that's meant persecution, prison, and worse. But the state of the First Amendment now, in this time of war and terror? That's our focus for this edition of Due Process. Major funding for Due Process provided by the New Jersey State Bar Foundation committed to educating the public about the law. And by the Fund for New Jersey, a private foundation focusing on New Jersey public policy issues. Additional funding provided by Lawyer's Diary and Manual and online legal reference, elaw.com. can be a delicate balance, national security and constitutionally secured rights, liberty and loyalty, free speech and the suppression of dissent. It's a balance, a conflict as old as the Republic, one we wrestle with again with a war underway in Iraq and a war on terror here at home. So on this premier edition of our 10th due process season and on next week's show as well, we explore that delicate balance with experts from both sides of the scale. The national president of the American Civil Liberties Union here to argue that free speech and civil liberties are under government assault. But also here, a Rutgers law professor with a very different point of view and a former federal attorney, the lead prosecutor in the first World Trade Center bombing, who insists that groups like the ACLU just don't understand the extent of the terror threat and the need to counteract that threat. A critical conversation in this half hour and next week's too. But first, as always, here's Sandy King with still more expert opinion from the field and some historical perspective. Sandy? Raymond, the history too often is not a pretty picture. From the infamous Sedition Act of 1798 to Lincoln's suspension of habeas corpus. The prosecution during World War I of 2,000 who opposed the war and the draft, and the assault on free speech of the Cold War and Vietnam. It's a history that may shock us, one we may not learn in school. But it just may help us to understand how issues of free speech and war are playing out in our own tense times. Like George Bush is the only one who could have pointed to Afghanistan on a map and said, destroy that. Irreverent, sure. Offensive. I'm sorry, George Bush pointing out a country on a map. <laughs> Maybe. Protected, absolutely. Hey, let's go! But in time of war, is that protection no. tested? No. No. And is that as it should be? Hey, their vehicles on fire. The free speech tradition properly in the United States protects the Nazis, protects Operation Rescue in their uh, activities at abortion clinics, protects the advertisers of cigarettes, the advertisers of alcohol. And anti-government protest, no matter how strident. Members of Congress, this is Michael Moore. I would like to read to you the USA Patriot Act. Section 1. No matter how, against being. the tide. So it is unthinkable to me today that colored peoples in any part of the world would ever join a war or a tax upon the Soviet Union. Paul Robeson, an example of what the consequences can be of free speech, even in America. You show a little grit and you land in a jail. There is fear during times of war, serious crisis. The leadership feels that it needs to respond to those fears in ways that suppress uh, criticism or dissent. Robeson, back in McCarthy's day, lost his passport, his right to travel, and much of his right to work. Although the war he challenged 
was the cold kind. If the land ain't free. First Amendment rights were uh, simply a race. So the government not only suppresses uh, dissent or that that it feels is dissent, it does it irrationally. Prison gates close on the nation's top reds. But a half century later, is free speech suppression safely behind us as we fight both the war in Iraq and a war on terrorism? Every time we hit a time of crisis, a time of war, a time of emergency, we overreact, we engage in a certain kind of pathological behavior, infringing free speech and other civil liberties when we don't have to. And it is those infringements that Jeff Stone traces in his perilous times. Inevitably, there are uh, pressures on people to either conform or at least conform what they say to being, quote, patriotic in time of war. A book so important, it spurred Rutgers Law School Camden to call a two-day national conference. It's opening venue fittingly, the National Constitution Center, Philadelphia. I was tempted to call my speech freedom at times when we are very, very nervous. It's keynote speaker, uh, First Amendment lawyer Floyd though, Abrams, uh, who insists uh, there out. is still good reason to be nervous. Is there an ongoing emergency? My own view remains that the degree of threat to our individual security is unparalleled in American history. If I thought otherwise, I would not be at all so ready even to consider any painful compromises between the claims of security and freedom. Claims that in earlier times of crisis and war led to jailings, lynchings, official disregard of the most basic civil liberties. World War I, it became literally impossible to criticize the war. Uh, Eugene Debs, who was the leader of the Socialist Party and received um, a million votes for president in 1912, uh, criminally prosecuted and sentenced to 10 years in jail for giving a speech critical of the war and the draft, would be analogous today to, to, um, uh, to having John Kerry or Howard Dean prosecuted for their criticism of the war in Iraq. In World War II, not just speech, but actual liberty was on the line and upheld by the courts. When Japanese Americans were put in concentration camps solely on the basis of their race. It is painful, morally obnoxious, to read cases such as Hirabayashi and Karamatsu today. And the First Amendment challenged again by the excesses of the McCarthy era. Uh, you know, an official paranoia of the Vietnam War. The next stop is Vietnam. Those days are over. Jane Fonda wasn't jailed, but she was demonized as Hanoi Jane, while Martin Luther King fell victim to brutal government tactics after he spoke out against the war. Not even the marching of mighty armies can halt us. J. Edgar Hoover, the longtime director of the FBI, stepped up his long active vendetta against King. Wiretaps, constant innuendo, lies, threats, plants on the staff. They told me what it was like. They told me all about it. But... By comparison, the public pressure brought to bear on celebrities like Whoopi Goldberg or Linda Ronstadt, entertainers who spoke out critically post 9-11. May seem mild. For the to come back again. Unless, of course, you're on the receiving end. The Dixie Chicks found out what the cost of dissent could be, at least on a career. You know, they said you wouldn't come, but we knew you'd come because we have the greatest fans in the whole wide world. So while surveillance and secrecy have been stepped up, the pressures are more subtle these days, and none of it is reserved for celebrities. Not long after 9-11, an organization that was founded by uh, Lynn Cheney, the uh, current, the wife of the secretary of the vice president, um, posted a list of, of individual names and quotes, you know, a sort of a hit list, uh, which was some people 
I, I was on there, you know. Of course, the impact post 9-11 has been greatest in communities like this one. Well, shocking as it may sound, racial profiling is not only just, sometimes not only justifiable, but desirable. Here, government interrogations and even detentions have on occasion resulted from free and critical speech. I said, no, we're not kidding you, we're FBI. Someone called us and told us that you were making disparaging remarks about the United States. But in the wider society, the consequences of dissenting speech have been less severe. The censorship often self-imposed. If they know they're going to be accused of being disloyal or traitorous, uh, that might threaten their job, it might make their kids uncomfortable. So it's easy to fall into the, the realm of self-censorship. It doesn't require lynching to, to produce that result. And if dissent, with its roots deep in the century past, does seem to be met these days with greater tolerance, Stone says that may be just a matter of timing, of distance, from 9-11. We saw another 9-11 type attack. This would change instantly. And we would see, again, a rallying around the flag and a sense that uh, anyone who criticizes the nation in those circumstances is being disloyal. And th those pressures, again, can become very intense. And if another attack is in the offing, just how far is too far in trying to prevent it? Professor Stone says that despite those earlier attacks on free speech, the democracy survived because once the war or national crisis had passed, the Constitution reasserted itself, rights were restored. But the essential question today may be if the threat of terror has no end, if the war against terror could, in Stone's words, grind on indefinitely. Does a new kind of war need a new set of rules to keep us safe and free? And that's one of the questions we'll put to our guests, a professor of constitutional law, an expert on terrorism, and a national civil liberties leader. So stay with us. You certainly don't want to put the uh, troops in, in harm's way or you just want to show your patriotism and uh, do the right thing for this great country of ours. Should be freedom of speech. I think everybody should be able to speak what they feel as long as it's competent. America is built on free speech. I'm a Vietnam veteran and I have a right to say anything I want. Now, of course, if it's going to be negative, we don't want negative speech. We want positive speech to come forth. No, it's it's a, it's a really important. There's a lot of different um, views that people have, I and mean, you, you disagree with what Bush says, and, and everybody needs to hear it out. Say what you want. Not that it's going to matter, right? People always should be able to speak what they want to say anytime they want to say it. That's what America is about. I think uh, if you can't express what you feel, then it's not a democracy. So is free speech really on the line? Civil liberties under attack? We're likely to get a wide range of response from New York Law School professor Nadine Strassen, the national president of the ACLU, from Earl Maltz, the distinguished professor of law at Rutgers Camden, who has written extensively on civil rights and the Constitution. And with us from Newark, former federal prosecutor Andrew McCarthy. He's now a senior fellow at the Foundation for the Defense of Democracies, but back in the 90s, he led the prosecution on the blind sheik Omar Abdel Rahman and the accused terrorists in the World Trade Center bombing. But here we're going to start with you, Nadine, because it seems to me that the question we're presented with is, at this moment in history, are we faced with an assault on civil liberties? And since you're the head of the organization that is looked to to be the, the warning cry, tell us. Absolutely. And I have to stress, Raymond, that it is not only the ACLU and civil libertarians, but also national security experts who have been joining with us in complaining that a number of the measures that have cut back on our freedoms post 9-11 are not justified, are not necessary, and indeed are not even effective Let me in terms of can... promoting national security. Let me ask if I can focus on speech to begin with. And, and that generalization okay. is true of speech in particular. Uh, for example, post 9-11, there have been 
increasing crackdowns on uh, the rights of peaceful protesters. Uh, there are many examples here in New Jersey, but also around the country, uh, where police have engaged in abuse and harassment and intimidation of people who are simply trying to express dissenting views with respect to the war in Iraq and other post-9-11 policies. Uh, people have been arrested merely for even sometimes not even being part of the demonstration, but just being in the vicinity of demonstrators who have been uh, held overnight in very inhumane conditions, who have been interrogated about their political okay. beliefs, their religious affiliations. All right, let me ask Earl, how do you respond to that? Well, I think there have been, I have no doubt that there have been incidents when people's uh, rights were invaded unnecessarily. But I think, uh, I don't see any general crackdown on civil liberties. I see people saying what they want and doing what they want pretty much as much as uh, as ever. Uh, there may be, and I think in part that's it due to the fact that there isn't a real sense throughout the country that there is a massive emergency. Uh, if, I'm sorry. I mean, we can never tell what the effect of self-censorship is going to be, going to one of the points that Jeff Stone made. And I certainly know individuals who have yeah. been subject to police brutality who simply are not demonstrating anymore. Andy, let me ask you to respond really to two questions that have been raised here. One is whether you see signs of aggressive government conduct that restricts free speech or the self-censorship that Nadine just referred to as a result of whatever the government has done. I, I think there's always a tension between civil liberties and national security and when you have to step up national security activity that necessarily results in a cutback on sub, some of our civil, civil liberties. I think the point that's missed is that there's a historical trajectory here. Um, the cutbacks that we see today um, are alarming to some, understandably. Um, but compared to where we were, as Professor Stone describes it, in 1798 or uh, during the Civil War or during the first two world wars, it's, it's almost a different world. Is it, I, your argu let me be, is it your argument that they are minimal or that whatever intrusions are, are justified? Both. I, I argue that uh, they are minimal. Um, the intrusions that have been made uh, are justifiable. And I would also stress the historical trajectory that um, when when this tension goes back and forth over time where it settles as time goes on is a very progressive uh, progressive result for civil liberties I think that, it, I think, uh, that that reflects the fact what what Nadine is talking about uh, reflects in part the fact that we are in an era of extraordinary rights consciousness that is that people that there's this heightened feeling that we have, we have rights in America and that they're very broad. And so as, as a result, even the most minor infringements on those rights are exaggerated and blown out of proportion. Let me ask you this question, Nadine. Is it your view that there are no rights in the free speech area that ought to be infringed even given the apparent emergency or that there are some areas of possible compromise but the government is overstepped? I would simply advocate what the Constitution itself provides and how the Supreme Court has uh, in modern times always interpreted it, which is that free speech and other rights are not absolute, but that to justify a restriction, the government has an appropriately heavy burden of proof, not just to assert that we are facing a danger of terrorism, which I certainly don't dispute, but more particularly to show that that restriction is actually necessary in order to help us fight the war on terrorism. And in fact, many of the violations of free speech that are very dramatic are counterproductive. For example, the unprecedented shroud of secrecy that this government has thrown over every aspect of its post 9-11 investigation makes it harder for we the people, including our elected representatives in Congress, to ensure that these measures are effective for security. Andy, this is a very interesting point Nadine makes because Professor Stone uh, actually argues that the most uh, egregious manifestation of violations at the moment on the government's part in this area is secrecy and excessive secrecy. Do you agree that that belongs in the discussion about First Amendment restrictions and that it is significant and or excessive? Well, I, it, secrecy is a necessary result of having to deal with national security issues, uh, but it also is something that needs to be closely scrutinized. I think um, I, I hear what Nadine is saying. I uh, actually agree with some of the principles she lays out, um, but in, in practice, uh, the fact of the matter is that there has to be some rhythm for the government 
to be able to maintain classified information right. and secrecy. Andy, let me interrupt for one second. Lady, can you focus the conversation a little bit? Tell us what you think is the most outrageous example of government secrecy in this area that we ought to be most concerned about. It's hard to pick um, because even Congress has not been able to get basic information, just statistical information. I completely agree with Andy that if you're talking about a prosecution of a single individual, of course the government should have the opportunity to invoke the statutory protections that exist to show to a judge that a particular piece of evidence should be held secret. But to simply say, for example, that all deportation hearings of all post 9-11 detainees who have already been held in secret, that all of those are closed to every member of the press, every member of Congress, every member of the public. How can that possibly be justified? And it's under that shroud of secrecy that we now learn, thanks to the courageous reports of the Inspector General of the Justice Department itself, that terrible abuses were committed. That is the other danger of secrecy, that people's rights are abused and our security is not enhanced because not a single one of those individuals was charged with a terrorist-related crime. Well, we haven't heard from you on secrecy as to whether you think this is a troublesome development. Well, I think uh, with Andy, I believe that uh, the amount of secrecy necessary is ba de depends upon the exact the specific context in which we're talking and it's hard for me to answer the the, the general uh, assertion that, that there's been too much secrecy. I suspect that sometimes there has been more secrecy that's been necessary, but sometimes the secrecy has been, sometimes it has been necessary. Again, but without more specific. There should be a case by case determination, is, is the overall point that I'm making. In the I'm context of deportation, for example, the Justice Department seems to have taken the position that there should be blanket coverage of secrecy. Do you agree that it should be blanket, or as Nadine suggests, looked at on a case by case basis? Uh, I really haven't thought about that enough Fair. to have a. <laughs> okay. Andy, did you have a view on that? Yeah, I, I guess uh, two responses. Number one, uh, one of the things we've learned since 9-11 is that we had an appalling lack of intelligence uh, and that we're highly dependent for whatever intelligence we have actually on foreign intelligence services. In terms of the national security of the United States, if you can't assure the foreign governments that we have to deal with that when they give us information that they regard as sensitive, methods and sources of intelligence, if they think that that's going to be compromised in, in litigation, in, in American judicial proceedings, that source of information that we're reliant on for our national security uh, is gone. It, it dries up. Secondly, in terms of the immigration proceedings, the fact that people were not charged with terrorist violations, uh, I think much too much is made of that. If, in fact, you had people who, by evidence, were tied to terrorism, but you had another vehicle for getting them ejected from the country without having to compromise the information, naturally, what you would do is deport them on the basis of w w the violation that allowed you to deport them without having to reveal the, the national security information, which is vital to our uh, security. Um, if you could accomplish that a different way, I don't know why you would conceivably. Is that that. An what he suggested is that somehow the alternative to a blanket secrecy is to risk national security, given the fact that some deportations may be based on national security. Absolutely not. I completely trust the judiciary in this country to be, if anything, too respectful of claims for needed uh, secrecy on the part of the government. Uh, but I not, also want to get sorry. back to a point I mentioned earlier, which is that the government is also refusing to give even statistical information that could not possibly compromise any particular investigation, including refusing to give Congress statistical information about how often it has used the secret new powers or the powers of secret surveillance under the USA Patriot Act, not telling the names of the people against whom it's used those powers, but just in how many situations. How can Congress possibly make a responsible determination of whether those powers are effective, whether they should be allowed to sunset at the end of this year as scheduled to do, whether they should be expanded, unless they know how they're being used in general, not in particular situations. All right, we're going to leave the discussion at this moment suspended, uh, but that's just for this half hour because the conversation is going to continue next week with this distinguished panel. ACLU President Nadine Strassen, Rutgers Law Professor Earl Maltz, and former terrorism prosecutor, prosecutor Andrew McCarthy. So you won't want to miss the next due process. Till then, for Sandy King and all of us here, I'm Raymond Brown. Thanks for watching.
don't think there should be limitations. I think people should be able to express their own views and, and express how they feel. People get carried away with free speech, and I feel they there need to be some parameters on what really free speech is. It's un-American, you know, to have restrictions on freedom of speech. That's what makes our country our country. We cannot have the public riled up when we're in a time of crisis. We have to think of what the outside world can do to us and protect ourselves as people even more than our liberties. That's why people come here because we have free speech. You see cops all over the place, um, homeland security, everything is being watched. Everything is always being watched. I think people have uh, voiced their opinion as much now as they ever have, if not more so. Everybody should be able to say what they want to say and that's, that's why this is the United States of America. Major funding for due process provided by the New Jersey State Bar Foundation, committed to educating the public about the law, and by the Fund for New Jersey, a private foundation focusing on New Jersey public policy issues. Additional funding provided by Lawyer's Diary and Manual and online legal reference, elaw.com.